and madly teach chapter two, the philosophical basis of modern education. Much of modern educational thought has its roots in the past, in the reformers Rousseau, Froebel, and Paralozzi, but I think it would be generally agreed that the philosophical godfather of the movement is John Dewey. Traditionally, philosophers are scholarly, bookish individuals who are happy to idle in quiet backwaters, avoiding the mainstream of the life about them, content in the hope that whatever small contribution they may make to the total of the world's thought will make itself apparent to future students examining a past age. But a happy exception to this tradition is Professor Dewey, whose long life may rightfully be called a useful one, and whose thought has had the most direct and potent sort of influence on the society in which he has lived, and in the one field of educational theory has been the dominant influence in America during the past 50 years. In considering first the larger philosophy of Mr. Dewey, I do so with some trepidation. For the amateur philosophy contains semantic pitfalls. It has a jargon of its own. The outsider can never be certain he is using words in the same meaning they have for the initiated. This is especially true in dealing with a philosopher with a style as austere and unbending as Professor Dewey's. One's optimism regarding correct interpretation is not heightened by the fact that such distinguished colleagues of Dewey's as Santayana and Bertrand Russell have been accused by him of misunderstanding his philosophical position. What follows then is offered in the hope that it does not do too great a violence to the original. Assuming that the most important element in a system of philosophy is its theory of knowledge, Dewey's great contribution to philosophy has been the development of the pragmatic, or as he calls it, the instrumental experimental theory of knowing. He follows in the tradition of Charles Pierce and William James, the founders of pragmatism, although he differs widely from James, whose pragmatism was bound up with matters of religion and beliefs, which have no appeal for Dewey. Dewey maintains that reality is that which is experienced and that everything outside of experience is unreal and for all practical purposes non-existent. Hence, knowledge is always functional and concrete, never theoretical and abstract. He would agree with James that ideas, which are parts of our experience, are instruments of response and adaptation, and their truth is not to be judged by any absolute standards, but in terms of their effectiveness. In other words, that is true value, which works satisfactorily. He strongly rejects philosophical idealism with its doctrine that fundamental and ultimate reality is to be found in the mind. With equal positiveness, he rejects the position of the realist who maintains that reality exists independently of mental perception. Perhaps I can illustrate these conflicting theories by resorting to the time-honored device of philosophers of taking a physical object as an example and reasoning about reality. I will take the desk upon which I am writing and see how these different philosophical spokesmen regard it. The idealist will say that the desk exists as a concrete reality only when I perceive it, and that when I leave the room it ceases to exist except in the mind of God who perceives everything and at all times. The realist, on the other hand, will say that the desk exists independently of my perception of it and will continue to exist if I leave the room and never come back. Now, if your pragmatist instrumentalist is asked for an opinion, he will differ radically from both the idealist and the realist. He will say that the question of the desk's existence is academic and irrelevant until I have an experience in relation to it, that is, until a practical problem to be solved about the desk arises. It may be a simple problem, such as, is the desk too heavy for me to move unaided to another part of the room? My idea is a response to the particular situation and a plan of action, and after I have lifted or pushed the desk to determine its weight, my idea is instrumental in creating the object of knowledge, which in this case is the degree of heaviness of the desk. 
By the way, in illustrating how these theories of knowledge differ, I paraphrased with permission a section of Frederick S. Breed's excellent article, A Realistic View of Education, appearing in 20th Century Education, the New York Philosophical Library, 1946. This does not mean, of course, that Mr. Breed would necessarily agree with my interpretation of Dewey's philosophy. The concept of intelligence put forward by this philosophy is biological and behavioristic. It is the concept of animal intelligence limiting human thought to its function as an organic response to the stimuli of the environment. Mr. Dewey's critics have insisted that instrumentalism is highly subjective, and certainly a philosophy based on the idea that only that which is experienced is real may be fairly said to lean heavily toward subjectivism. Indeed, it would seem that if Mr. Dewey were really consistent in his theory that knowledge is born only of active experience, he must feel he has wasted his time in writing some score or more volumes trying to give others experience vicariously. It should not be supposed, however, from the subjective nature of this philosophy, that its author neglects the social. On the contrary, no one has been more insistent in emphasizing the social character of intelligence or more optimistic about the possibilities of directing it. Indeed, Mr. Dewey's enthusiasm has led him to be a great believer in the virtues of scientific planning as the means of achieving the brave new world. Now, Dewey's larger philosophy is closely related to education. As he himself has said, philosophy is really the general theory of education. What are this particular philosopher's educational theories? Well, his idea of reality and conception of knowledge maintains, of course, that knowledge is primarily active, not passive. He has always belittled an education, as he says, which appeals for the most part simply to the intellectual aspect of our natures and has consistently appealed for a curriculum that would emphasize our impulses, quote, to make, to do, to create, to produce, unquote. If I understand Dewey aright, the important thing about knowing and experience is not the end, but the actual process itself. This unfolding and continuous experience is what he calls growth, and it is this growth that is important without, as far as I can see, any answers being provided to the all-important question, growth towards what? In defining ends, Dewey never seems to get beyond such vague terms as desirable and satisfactory. As each experience, according to this philosophy, is sufficient unto itself, Education should not be a preparation for the future, but should be concerned with the present and immediate capabilities and interests of the learner. Democracy, and here Dewey uses the word as synonymous with education, is the, quote, faith that the process of experience is more important than any special results obtained, so that special results achieved are of ultimate value only as they are used to enrich and order the ongoing process. Unquote. Dewey's pragmatism comes to the fore in his insistence that education must be scientific and experimental. His position is that in teaching, and indeed in all human and social relationships, we must approach the subject exactly as a scientist approaches his physical laboratory tests. We do not start off with preconceived notions of what is true, but must search for what is workable by weighing and testing evidence, gathering facts, and producing proofs. As the truths of physical science are modified by changing conditions and new knowledge, so are the truths of human nature. There are no ultimates or any universal timeless human values. Such traditional concepts as God and truth and even the existence of the unseen cosmos are not things that can be verified in experience, but only speculated about. And speculation, according to Dewey, has real value only when it results in concrete, measurable ends. Here, Dewey was the forerunner of the now considerable group of social scientists who urge us to abandon our ingrained habits of metaphysical thought, 
and throw ourselves for salvation into the arms of science. Let us not brood over imponderables, say these brethren. Let's not engage in idle speculation about ultimate issues, but let us be concerned with the here and now, with knowledge of conditions as they are, to use Dewey's own phrase. And out of our scientific weighing and measuring will emerge all the quote-unquote truth we need for a happy life. In the light of Dewey's philosophy and its general education implications, what are his concrete proposals for educational reform? Well, a philosopher is not expected to produce a program of practical action, and ordinarily Mr. Dewey is suitably vague. But the following statement from his book, Experience in Education, suggests some explicit reforms. He says, If one attempts to formulate the philosophy of education implicit in the practices of the new education, we may, I think, discover certain common principles. To imposition from above is opposed expression and cultivation of individuality. To external discipline is opposed free activity. To learning from texts and teachers, learning through experience. To acquisition of isolated skills and techniques by drill is opposed acquisition of them as means of attaining ends which make direct vital appeal. To preparation for a more or less remote future is opposed making the most of the opportunities of present life. To static aims and materials is opposed acquaintance with a changing world. Unquote. If the reader will bear with me, I shall try to show how the influence of this philosophy of education has been unfortunate. But perhaps I should first point out that it is somewhat unfair and inaccurate to hold up Dewey, as some extremists among schoolmen of the traditional persuasion have done, as the unmitigated villain of American education. Some of the reforms of the so-called progressive group, as led by Dewey, Kilpatrick, and others, have generated a healthy, needful breeze in a sometimes stuffy atmosphere. The primary contribution of this group, stemming from the early reforms advocated by Pestalozzi and Rousseau, has been the introduction of humaneness in education, the recognition of the child as an individual and not a robot, an individual who needs to live a happy and expressive life in the present, as well as in some remote future, that the progressives have carried individuality to sentimental and even sometimes unscientific links is undoubtedly true. But most adults who are not blinded by nostalgia for their own good old days would admit, I think, that the progressive emphasis on humane consideration of the child's personality has tended to make classrooms of today happier places than those of 25 or 50 years ago. Another valuable contribution of Dewey and his followers has been the emphasis on action, the attempt to relate thinking and doing, the mental and the physical. Here again, however, exaggeration has crept in, and a basically sound idea has been blown up to foolish proportions. In his zeal for the old and tried, the traditionalist should not overlook the many sensible aids to teaching and some of the sound guiding principles undoubtedly contained in progressive education. It is enough to point out that the movement has had a tendency to erect methods into dogmas, with the unfortunate result that the process of learning overshadows the content, content to be learned. In its pure form, Dewey's philosophy of education had its most notable practical application in the progressive movement, chiefly confined to private schools, which saw its heyday in the decade 1925 to 1935, and which has since been somewhat modified and even emasculated. But the Deweyan line, again modified and toned down, has been seeping into the faculties of schools of education during the past 25 years until today, this modified version of progressive education is largely the official philosophy of American public school education. I think one of the chief reasons it has triumphed with comparative ease 
is to be found in the changing practical conditions of the public schools. To take an obvious example, in the kind of human material it contained, the high school of 1900 or even of 1920 was a far more selective and homogeneous group than the high school of today. The student body was on the whole of good average intelligence, capable of being educated and more important, anxious to be. Our high school population today, 1949, is swollen to huge proportions, over 6 million in 1941, as against a little over 2 million in 1919, and is extremely heterogeneous, including millions of youths who formerly were absorbed into the various trades upon graduation from grammar school. And a large number of these, as much as one-third of the total high school population, according to some estimates, are what educators sometimes call nonverbal. That is, they do not learn easily by use of the traditional printed word. As this condition became more and more acute, the public school system was faced with two alternative ways of meeting it. One, a hard way calling for the utmost in ingenuity and patience. The other, an easy and far more tempting way. The first way is based on the conviction that education consists of the attempt to transmit the whole heritage of man's progress through history and to evolve from that stu study spiritual and moral standards by which the individual learner can live in the contemporary world. This way assumes that education is a basic need of everyone regardless of his capabilities. To give youth this kind of education with any degree of success is a task of enormous difficulty in the face of the variegated conglomerate mass of our public school population. It means that teachers have to devise for the one-third who cannot be reached by conventional and traditional methods radically new means and techniques of teaching. It is especially important to reach this group in the high school, for they are the ones who do not go on to higher institutions of learning. Perhaps it can't be done. Perhaps it is too Herculean a task. If my own slight experience with teachers is any criterion, I would say that most of them are very pessimistic on this score. It would seem that our American public school system as a whole is not meeting the challenge of changing conditions in this manner. It is choosing the other and easier way. Harassed to the point of desperation by trying to teach history to non-verbal Johnnies or grammar to unbookish Marys, American teachers fell with loud hosannas on the famous statement of Mr. Dewey's. Quote, not knowledge or information, but self-realization is the goal. Literally, we must take our stand with the child and our departure from him. It is he and not the subject matter which determines both quality and quantity of learning. Unquote. Here was a doctrine that released the teacher from his responsibility for handing on the traditional knowledge of the race a doctrine that firmly implied that one need not adhere to any standards of knowledge, but simply cater to individual interests. And it was made the more attractive by the suggestion that this procedure was to be undertaken in behalf of self-realization, an ideal to which only a brutish sort of person indeed could oppose himself. With the acceptance of this doctrine, American public school education took the easy way to meet its problems with the result painfully obvious today, namely, that the problems have not been solved, but are aggravated to the point of breakdown and chaos. This is the inevitable result of adopting instrumentalism as a philosophy of education, for it teaches that there are no intellectual or moral standards of knowledge, that no subject is intrinsically of any more value than any other subject. In the end, it reduces education to a vast, bubbling confusion in which training in mechanical skills is put on a par with the development of mind and imagination, in which hairdressing and embalming are just as important, if not a little more so, in history and philosophy. 
It is a peculiarly American philosophy, for it buttresses many of our national prejudices, distrust of abstract and disinterested thought, and pleasure in concrete action and affairs, suspicion of those who do not conform to the average and delight in whatever works. Bertrand Russell's observation that Dewey is preeminently the philosopher of American industrialism seems apt. Even more so does the remark of Ludwig Lewinson, made many years ago, that Mr. Dewey is, quote, the prophet of an increasingly desolate and arid period of the spirit. I do not mean to imply that Dewey is blindly accepted as a patron saint of modern education, or that educators have adopted his ideas and point of view without reservations. That would be assigning an importance and significance to personal influence, which it rarely, if ever, exerts. But it does seem to me that Dewey and his more articulate followers came along at a period when educators were desperately seeking solutions to change practical problems and provided not detailed plans, but general directions that the educators have accepted in spirit. Among such a large group, there are, of course, varying shades of opinion and inter interpretation, but there is emerging today a fairly consistent educational philosophy which may differ in details, but is basically Deweyan. The doctrines of the new education are many. They have not all been translated as yet into general practice in our public schools, but they are making considerable inroads, and there's every indication that they will ultimately triumph.